Uh, good to be with you. Uh, we've, we're advancing by God's grace in our study of the Gospel of Luke, and we've reached uh, chapter 14 in a continuation of our Lord's work and ministry at his, as he made his way to his final destination of Jerusalem. As he journeyed, uh, he revealed in both uh, action and words uh, the way of his kingdom, uh, what should characterize it and what should not characterize it. And so the lessons from these chapters should be of great benefit to all of us who want to emulate uh, the characteristics of one who would be a disciple of Jesus, one who would follow after him. So let's read it. I brought my glasses. We're going to read the first 14 verses of Luke chapter 14. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. Eat bread is a euphemism for having a meal. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent and he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day, and they could make no reply to this. There's a bit of textual confusion there in uh, verse five. Uh, some, uh, m many versions, uh, uh, many t uh, texts, uh, manuscripts say different things. Some say donkey, uh, say uh, some add sheep, but you get the idea and you can imagine why some scribe might have thought he didn't mean ox, he meant but the best, best evidence is what he's really saying is which one of you will have a son or even an ox and it fall into a well and you, you'll immediately pull him out. Verse 7, and he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed the, how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last uh, place. But when you're invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Uh, then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he also uh, went on to say to the one who had invited him, so this is the the host, he addresses the host. Uh, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, as you have just done, uh, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That last clause is, is somewhat loaded. Well, I tried, to, I tried to arrive at a title for our study this morning uh, that would capture the, these companion lessons uh, found in the verses, and I came up with what uh, you might see on the outline, the compassion, compassion versus self-advancement. It could have been the outward uh, versus the inward, or compassion 
versus pride. But hopefully you can see uh, the association of these terms with what we've just read from the life of the Lord. The more one studies the Bible, the more we come to understand the importance of humility and compassion. Humility, uh, disdaining a mistakenly high view of oneself in exchange for God's view of us, which properly takes into account all our frailties and our propensity to sin, uh, to the violation of his commandments and the standards he demands. And compassion, uh, transferring our, transfixing upon oneself onto others, uh, summed up nicely in the Bible by the command to love your neighbor as yourself. The two together are the teaching of both the Old and the New Testaments. Proverbs 16, 18, for example, teaches us pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Also, uh, the well-known Micah 6, verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your God. And then uh, in the New Testament, there is the de rigueur example from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't look out merely for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And so we find both. Uh, humility and compassion uh, displayed and then addressed by our Lord in our passage. Luke begins the chapter by jumping right into the occasion he wishes to describe. It happened, he writes, a very common way in the language of expressing an advance in a story. Uh, it came about, we might say, that when Jesus went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. Uh, the host is described as a leader of the Pharisees, whatever in particular that means. It means at least that he was an important uh, man. Uh, the situation is a meal, uh, perhaps even a banquet, hosted by the man on the Sabbath day. And this was a culturally familiar thing uh, to do, to have a meal with guests on the Sabbath who had been specially invited, making it a, a special meal. So on the surface, uh, the setting is the Pharisee's house and the fact that it was the Sabbath. I say on the surface, uh, that's the setting. But the importance of the account as we read along is not simply the setting, but Jesus' concern for the condition, the suffering of one of the guests. And so we see these two spheres uh, operating in sync, one with the other. The other guest mentioned suffered from dropsy. Uh, Luke uh, tells us that. Uh, dropsy is a disease in which the body swells up and uh, fluids form in the tissues and in the cavities of uh, the body. Perhaps some of you uh, have been acquainted with that kind of a really vexing affliction with a friend or loved one in a hospital and during a dangerous buildup of these fluids and the medical staff with all the advancements that we have today, uh, trying one remedy after another to, to determine the cause for the, the, the fluid buildup and, and treat it before it leads to more uh, threatening issues or becomes fatal. Uh, the, the suffering is real. Uh, the verse says there was a man with dropsy, okay, but the, the, this was real suffering. Uh, that was taking place in, in this uh, person. And so this man appears in our gospel as a guest at the same uh, dinner as Jesus. And interestingly, uh, Luke wants us to know that the man was in front of uh, the Lord. And as he observed him, uh, the Pharisees at the table were watching him closely. Not the man, Jesus. Jesus. 
And all of which might make one begin to think that the special dinner was a setup uh, and that the host and his fellow Pharisees had colluded to prepare a trap. As one of the commentators put it, a snare was prepared for the compassionate Jesus and the bait was the misery of this poor man he would find irresistible. Well, that idea is, is supported by the introduction in verse 3 of an answer by Jesus. You see it there, Jesus answered. Uh, no question has been spoken, at least recorded. But uh, there's this answer as if the setting was a kind of unspoken challenge made by the host to him, something along the lines, so what are you planning to do now? That may be reading too much into it. The, the phrase uh, also appears at times in order just to move the action uh, along, but it, it certainly fits uh, the seeming sense of the scene set for us by Luke. He's a very sick man. Uh, they have seated him in front of Jesus, and in verse three, uh, we discover there are also lawyers at the mill. Surprise, surprise. So an unspoken challenge that becomes apparent in Jesus' answer, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or, or not? It's yet another Sabbath controversy. We've encountered them before in this gospel. Uh, all of you who are Bible students are not surprised to find one here. Back in chapter 6, you remember this. Jesus' disciples had been walking through the grain fields and they were picking off the heads of the grain to eat. They were hungry. It was the Sabbath. That looked like work uh, to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees had watched and then challenged the Lord for the act, actions of his disciples on the Sabbath. Well, immediately following that, on another Sabbath, he entered a synagogue where was, there was the man with the withered hand. We studied these passages, and, and there too, the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely, Luke wrote there, uh, to see if he healed on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. And after calling the man uh, forward, this is still chapter 6 of Luke, uh, Jesus asked them a similar question, verse 9. I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? They didn't answer him then. Uh, they were filled with rage when he healed the man. And now here at the Pharisees' leader's home, they're silent. It seems they could not find it within themselves to answer his question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? <laughs> such authority, uh, such boldness. Well, they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. The general rabbinic teaching at the time regarding healing on the Sabbath was that it was not allowed unless the suffering person's life was in danger. The, and that was not always something easy to uh, discern. So if they now, in essence, gave Jesus the nod uh, to heal the man, they would have left themselves open to the charge that they did not take the provisions of the law uh, seriously. But if they denied the legitimacy of healing the man, suffering as he plainly was, they might appear indifferent to his condition. And their silence spoke volumes. And the Lord, no doubt, discerned their dilemma and not having time for it, took hold of the man in verse 4 and healed him and sent him away. Problem solved. And now comes in verse 5 uh, the justification for his action in the form of a subtle accusation that dares his critics to enter personally into the man's history. I hope you'll notice this. With which one of you, he begins to ask, which one of you, which one of you? It's easy to sit up high in judgment of another, uh, supported only by a legalism devoid of mercy or compassion. And 
render a binding verdict with no cost to oneself, but to enter into the condition yourself and be faced with a decision that affects you personally because it affects someone dear to you. That alters the logic. It opens up the possibility of a different and more accurate interpretation. How would one of you respond is what Jesus is getting at. If your own son, or even just, still very valuable, even just your ox uh, falls into a well uh, to languish or even to die, and it's the Sabbath day, would you not immediately pull him out? Put like that, well, they could make no reply. In verse 4, they were silent because they didn't want to answer. Here they knew the answer, but out of fear refused to give the answer. They were overmatched. They were always overmatched in the face of Jesus. Their hypocrisy was obvious, as was the truth manifest in the Lord's challenge. For his was an argument from the lesser to the greater, comparing what mere humans will mercifully do even on the Sabbath when they, what they hold dear is threatened to the love and compassion of God put on display by His Son before their eyes. They were empty professors of an empty religion mired in the minutia of law-keeping. And therefore, they completely missed the very foundation of the law, which was love for God and for their neighbor. So they miss the most important thing. But as we now discover, <laughs> they did make allowance for advancing their own prestige before the eyes of their peers. Uh, Jesus noticed their behavior at this special uh, dinner. Uh, Luke tells us in uh, verse 7, uh, they had been picking out uh, the places of honor at the, the table. You can almost imagine Jesus uh, smiling sadly as he slowly uh, shook his head. And then he turned from a defense of his own compassionate actions to a penetrating unveiling of their own prideful longings for self-exaltation through the use of a parable. The occasion of the parable in verse 8 is an invitation to a wedding feast. Uh, the word most commonly refers to a wedding. It can also be just any kind of feast or, or banquet. Uh, the invitation had been extended, but it is what happens when the guests arrive that has arrested now Jesus's attention. There's a rush, a, a kind of mad scramble for the positions carrying the most uh, honor. Uh, that was apparently characteristic of the day, of this elite social class among the Jewish leadership, because earlier in chapter 11, verse 43, the Lord had criticized the Pharisees for uh, loving the chief seats in the synagogues. They knew how to identify the places of honor, and they would rush to occupy them. We shouldn't be too hard, I don't think, on the Pharisees and the scribes. It's a behavior uh, common to man, all you have to do is go to the airport and board one of the thousands of airplanes uh, that take off every day and just watch the comedy routine of the passengers with status racing to their coveted place in line and their coveted seats. I once had a client, a very good client, but a miserable human being. <laughs> who piled up frequent flyer miles because of his constant travel. So he had the status to always board with uh, the first uh, group. And, and sadly, I would occasionally have to travel with him. Uh, but happily, I got to witness uh, him elbow his way up to the front of the first queue uh, ignoring small children standing around waiting to board so that he could be the first, I'm not kidding, the first to enter and put his carry-on 
in the overhead bin and take his seat on the aisle in first class. <laughs> it was important to him because he was the most important man in his own life. <laughs> in a similar way, in the parable, we should imagine the, the first century dining room or banquet hall as something like an air carrier in which there are some really good seats and some not so good seats. And it was customary for the most prestigious places to be reserved for those guests possessing the most rank and distinction. They were what Luke denotes as the places of honor at the table. Protoclesia, Protoclesia, the first group. Did you know the Greek has a word for first class? <laughs> Protoclesia. The places to sit closest to the host, or in the case of a wedding, closest to the action up front. I'm sure you know this also, but in the first century, dining was different than today. It's not Leo, Leonardo da Vinci style. The tables were set low. Uh, the guests uh, lay at their place, at their distinguished place, uh, leaned on their elbow. We know this from uh, the Last Supper and uh, the description there. And there were places of honor, different uh, levels of honor at that table. And Jesus had observed the invited guests here uh, doing the very same thing, picking out uh, those places of honor. Uh, despite all their feigned religiosity, uh, they were in fact selfish and vainglorious striving to one-up each other in respect to status. And that was because their most earnest desire was not the approval of God in heaven, but the recognition before their contemporaries in this world. But there was a danger posed by that kind of behavior voiced now by Jesus in verses 8 and 9. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. Now, there's a risk then uh, to the kind of behavior Jesus was witnessing among the Pharisees, jockeying for a position so that one's individual reputation might be enhanced. It might just be that someone will come in after you who, in fact, is deemed more important than you, but for whom there is not the place uh, befitting his status available because you have lain down in it. And the host will have no choice but to come to you as the crowd of guests gaze upon you with pity and ask you to kindly remove yourself from that seat so that the more important person uh, can occupy it. No longer will you be the person preening with pride in your position, but instead the sad little man slinking away to the back in shame because by then those positions in the very back are the only ones not taken. Well, you may not have ever experienced anything like that before, but I have. The, the wedding of the daughter of a close friend. And uh, we're, we're there. Uh, we take our seats in a respectable location, not as close as we would have liked, but near enough. And though there was a row up front uh, closer with room for us, I said, no, no, let's not do that. But eventually we decided uh, to improve our position. Uh, after all, we were very close friends. <laughs> and there were still several empty rows even in front of, of, of there. And I have to say, I acquiesced very reluctantly to the move because I feared the possibility of what actually did happen. 
the family. The family began <laughs> to file in from a room in the back. It was quite a large family. <laughs> and they walked in steadily, an endless, endless stream of family filling the pews in front of us, uh, one after the other, until uh, a sense of dread came over me. <laughs> And I want you to know these verses actually came to my mind <laughs> at that moment. I promise you they did. The usher uh, recognized there would not be enough seating for the entire family, so he leaned over to us and he said in a hushed tone, I'm sorry, you're going to have to move from here. And then began the walk of shame. <laughs> Not, not daring uh, to even look upon the huge crowd <laughs> occupying uh, the, the church, uh, but marching straight to the last available seats on the far side aisle. I would have been happy to have just walked out of the back <laughs> of the church, but that would have only made it worse. Then I started thinking, I wish I'd brought my binoculars. <laughs> That's not true. That was. The Lord had it right in verse 9. Then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But Jesus didn't leave them with just that warning. He went on to teach the lesson. Here it is. It's in verse 10. But when you're invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Such a contrast. Oh, the open shame of the first course of action versus the public honor gained by the second. It's better by far to go to the lowest place first, from which you can only go up. But the Lord's aim was not to encourage a conniving way of advancing oneself in the world. He was encouraging true humility. I've told some of you this story before over the years. I had a friend in high school, a fellow believer, we were in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes together, and he went to First Baptist Church. But he once confided in me that he always prayed for humility. And that way he said the Lord might give him something to be humble about. <laughs> True story. Well, there's a certain logic to it, though, but only in a funny way. But that wasn't what the Lord was doing. He wasn't advising some kind of trick maneuver uh, designed to uh, work the worldly system and gain a counterfeit honor. He despised sham humility as much as prideful self-advancement. But God so works in our lives, as Leon Morris observed, uh, the truly humble person will end up where you ought to be and receive the honor that is due. We run no other risk than that of being exalted. It's a biblical idea. Uh, listen to Proverbs 25, verse 6. Uh, do not claim honor in the presence of the king and do not stand in the place of great men for it is better that it be said to you come up here than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince. Jesus states the principle uh, plainly in verse 11 uh, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The place we assume in the esteem of others is determined in sovereign and perfect precision by God and not by our own self-seeking efforts. Amen. We will see that when we come to chapter 18 and the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, a, a story I know you know well, 
the Pharisee was a proud, proud man who held himself up in his own mind above other people like this despised tax collector because of his self-serving tithing and fasting that he practiced before everybody. Uh, they were his means of elevating himself in his imagination above others. And all the while, the despised tax collector, the publican, was not even willing to lift up his eyes to heaven, but instead beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus rendered his appraisal of the situation between the two. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He taught that principle over and over again to his disciples. Can you imagine how often uh, he, uh, he taught them that? James and John following after him. Where are we going to be in the kingdom? We want to be on the right and on the left. Just example after example after example. Uh, Peter never is going to deny him. Never. And he did. So he taught that principle, and they saw that it realized, he saw, they saw it realized in his own person and ministry, the exaltation of Christ, so that Peter would one day be able to write in 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, quoting from Proverbs, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the right time. This is what God in Christ does. Uh, we may not see it in the here and now. And, and when we do see it, we mess it up. <laughs> but typically we don't see it. We may not see it in the here and now, but it will come about at the proper time because it is his work that will accomplish it. It is for us to humble ourselves and for God to exalt us. We're exalted in Christ in the here and now. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we're children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. That will be the ultimate exaltation of the believer in Jesus Christ. Not some 10-star badge bestowed on us by the world, but the privilege of participating in the glory of the Son of God. Amen. Well, with the statement of the principle, Jesus brought his parable to a conclusion, uh, but then he uh, turned his attention to the host himself in the closing verses. It pertained to his choice of guest for the meal. Uh, perhaps as he looked upon them all, he noticed, not perhaps, this is what he noticed, with the exception of the man suffering from dropsy, they were all cut from the same cloth, very expensive cloth. And his advice was that the important Pharisees should not just invite his friends so that they would reciprocate Invite, and invite him to their own affair, and that would be his only reward. But he should invite what we might call today the hoi polloi, uh, the poor and the needy, who would have no means of returning the favor, and then he would receive a heavenly reward. It's a similar lesson, think with me here, it's a similar lesson to the one he just given, but viewed from the converse perspective. And it reminds me of the admonition of James in James chapter 2 concerning favoritism and partiality. James urged his readers not to play favorites uh, with wealthy and important people who came into their church while dismissing with a short hello a poor man who might come in. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves, James asked. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who uh, love him? 
And just a side exhortation, if I may, let us never be accused of that. Uh, as we stand out in that hallway and people come in, let's consciously, consciously look for them, find them, talk to them. I know I'm going to talk to Sam and Christy when I see them, um, but I got to talk to you last week. <laughs> find those people and do more than a short hello uh, with them. You're thinking, well, that's what you do, and you're, you're right. Well, here in Luke's account, Jesus advises that when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brother or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. Of course, the Lord was not wishing to prohibit the, the kind of uh, normal social functions that we all engage in with family and friends. This is the kind of Semitic idiom that Jesus often adopted to make the point that one's social invitations should not so much be all of those, but should also include these people who would not be able to return uh, the favor. It was this kind of social prid pro quo uh, that likely plagues many of us. Limited time, uh, limited resources. Uh, we haven't seen the Joneses in a long time. Let's have the Joneses over. But we never quite get around to having over that couple whose name we keep forgetting. The Lord had made a similar point earlier in the gospel in chapter 6 in verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. It's the kind of attitude that keeps us from engaging in the kind of hospitality that our Lord continually urges upon us, and it betrays an ugly preference for putting our own desires and comfort first and above concern for others. Restricting our circle of friends is similar to choosing not to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I think it's significant. If you look at the next section of chapter 14, maybe you know what's coming, but if you glance at the next section, what's coming, uh, we find that it is our Lord himself, who practices uh, what he preaches. He does the same thing. Patterning our life and practice after him, we will inevitably act as he acts. Uh, what Jesus says in verse 13, inviting the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind to share in our fellowship and when we do, we will be blessed, not because they will have the means to reciprocate, but because it's God's way. It's God's way. And the promise in verse 14 is that we will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous when everything will be put right. That will be as one of uh, the commentators put it, an immense payoff. <laughs> an immense payoff. I deal in a world of hope for payoffs. That's my business. If I don't, if the deal doesn't go through, there is no payoff. <laughs> and uh, we, we get stuck in the trap of wanting an immense payoff. But this is the immense uh, payoff. Uh, it's a, an award that was long ago promised by Daniel in Daniel chapter 12. The glory of eternity for God's people. Uh, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Our ultimate reward 
our ultimate blessing is there where we will shine forever in the kingdom of God. Well, let's pray. Father, we're reminded as we read these verses, uh, not just of those early verses in uh, Philippians chapter 2, consider the other person as more important than yourself, uh, with humility of mind, regard them in that way. But of the latter verses that come out of that, as Jesus, the Son of God, emptied himself, and he took on human nature, and he was obedient, humbly obedient uh, to the point of death on the cross, and you highly exalted him. You gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord, Lord the mighty God. We thank you for that. We thank you that in great mercy and grace you have revealed him to us. May we emulate him in our behavior, in our attitude. We pray in his name. Amen.